All right, uh, this is going to be a commentary on the song I Love My Horse and Wagon, but Oh You Buick Car, Pub published in 1909. I have some really nice artwork there. As uh, the race car shoots past uh, Cyrus and his wife, Mary Jane, apparently, in their horse and wagon. <laughs> uh, I guess uh, according to uh, what's written on the cover here this is supposed to be a Buick race car being driven by Lewis Chevrolet uh, we'll get to him later anyway uh, here's some people who are mentioned in the song some photos of people who are mentioned not every person there's one or two more who are aren't pictured uh, respectfully dedicated to WJ w. Meade or Bill Meade which is this guy right here he was not a race car driver he was a judge or uh, whatever they call the people who referee car races I believe from con the context that he's mentioned in the song uh, First, just, uh, I'll just talk about these guys here. Victor H. Smalley, he was a journalist primarily, and he wrote a couple of books also. But he also wrote some songs. And it, it looks like he uh, pretty much always collaborated with Bernie Adler as, his, uh, as the, the composer. Uh, he lived from uh, 1878 to 1910. <laughs> He died at only 32, apparently of appendicitis or complications resulting from appendicitis. And uh, he was a magazine publisher. He wrote a few songs. Here's That Love and Rag. And that's one that's uh, still performed by ragtime piano players, I believe. Uh, a Mexican Tangle was a musical play, a one-act musical play, which he wrote with Bernie Adler in 1908, a year before this song was published, and uh, two books he wrote, one called The Great Northwest and another one called The New Irrigation Law and What It Means for the West. <laughs> I couldn't find a picture of him. I don't think. Let me see. Yeah, there's lots of uh, music covers, but uh, I, couldn't find a, I couldn't find a picture of him. Uh, the next person, uh, Bernie or Bernard Adler, he was a composer. Uh, this page here is at rag not rag, as ragpiano.com. He lived from 1879 to 1942. He wrote a bunch of songs, but I think he primarily uh, supported himself and his family as a salesman and sometimes as a bartender, I think. Uh, that Love and Rag, that's one of the popular uh, ragtime piano pieces that he wrote that uh, is still performed by ragtime piano p players today. And uh, a list of his songs in 1909, the same year that he wrote I Love My Horse and Wagon, he also wrote That Dreamy Rag and uh, that Dreamy Rag song. I guess one was uh, instrumental and one was a vocal version. And so, uh, not apparent, according to this article, not a whole lot is known about him. Uh, exactly where he got his musical education is now not known. So that's the writers, Victor Smalley and Bernie Adler. And we can just go through here. Starts out with uh, Cy Perkins and his wife Jane, or Mary Jane. They were going to town to sell some eggs, and they were, and uh, a roar and a ziss passed them with Louis Strang in his Buick car. Louis Strang was a famous race car driver, at least he was famous in 1909. He lived from 1884 to 1911. He was also very young, only 26 when he died. 
uh, as a result of uh, he was not driving he, it was a it was a car wreck but he was not in a race he was not even going fast he was barely moving but he moved over to try to avoid another slow moving vehicle and uh, he moved over too far on an incline and the car he was in rolled over on top of him and crushed him uh, but he was he was a famous race car driver in 1909 and he died two years later after this song was published uh, this picture that I'm showing is a picture of him at a, a, driving a Renault but he was on he was also a Buick driver all these guys mentioned in this song drove uh, Buick race cars at one time or another Uh, let's see, old side jerked on the rain and side to Mary Jane. And then we go into that chorus. Okay. And let's see, uh, second stanza. Uh, Mary Jane is doesn't like cars. She says she hopes to die before Cy ever gets her into a devil's car. <laughs> but she changes her mind. Uh, an, an interesting thing, her old blue eyes glared up with surprise when came Lewis Chevrolet. Uh, you can see right here, they write it. Let me zoom in more. They make sure they write it where it's known how to pronounce it. Here we see it spelled correctly, but here it's spelled with L-A-Y at the end, so you know to pronounce it Chevrolet. And that happens again there's more lyrics right down here see right here they do the same thing they spell his name correctly and then in parentheses they have it with a L-A-Y to, to make sure you know how to pronounce it which is interesting that means uh, that in 1909 Lewis Chevrolet although famous as a race car driver among racing fans it may not have been a household name the way he was now uh, Lewis Chevrolet was, of course, one of the founders of the Chevrolet Automobile Company. He lived from 1878 to 1941. Uh, unfortunately, he didn't really make any money from the car company that bore his name because he sold his uh, share in it at an early stage. And he made... Uh, he made most of his living as a race car driver. He was born in Switzerland and later immigrated to the United States and became a, an American citizen. And he had a thing in common with Ford in that he attempted uh, to get into the uh, airplane industry. As, uh, in a previous video, I talked about the Ford Fliver, uh, an experimental airplane that was built by Henry Ford. Uh, Lewis Chevrolet tried to uh, start, start an aircraft engine company, which he called Chevrolet, but it failed. Uh, Wikipedia says it failed because of the Great Depression which is a pretty good reason for it to fail. Became an American citizen in 1915, had a wife and family, and a pretty good racing career. And would have been quite well known, although not pop, apparently not well known enough that people knew how to cor correctly pronounce his name when they saw it written. <laughs> All right. He passed him by in a cloud of dust. Okay, there we go. Now we got all these extra stanzas down here that they didn't bother to put in the music, and sometimes these words don't match up too good. Bobby Berman. Bobby Berman was uh, an associate of Chevro Chevrolet. <clears throat> Another Buick race car driver. Lived from 1884 to 1916. And, uh, let's see now, when they reach Crown Point, George DeWitt, George DeWitt, he let them sit in his Buick and he turned her loose. So, uh, in stanza four, uh, the horse has gone lame 
so George DeWitt let Cy and Mary Jane sit in his in his Buick and Bu by this time Mary Jane was all for it she goes buy him let's try to sell the horse it ain't no use let's just get a car and then so Cy said to DeWitt gall darn it let her rip <laughs> uh, I could not find a picture of George DeWitt uh, the only thing I could find was this little bit of information here he was born in 1886 and died in 1937 and his racing career was in only 1909 that was his full career apparently he went on to other things after that but he was well known enough at least by uh, Victor Smalley that he got mentioned in this song and then this last stanza which is written in a different typeface and a different color which means somebody must have added it later as I mentioned a bunch of different cars loco uh, in a previous video I talked about the local movie local mobile car company I'm sure that's what loco is and then all these other car companies, Knox, Stoddard, Apperson, and Fiat, that were racing for the big Cobe Cup. The Cobe Cup existed for only two years in 1909 and 1910. Lewis Chevrolet won it in 1909. And uh, then another driver named Joe Dawson, who doesn't get mentioned in this song, probably because... He wasn't famous enough yet. He won it in 1910. And then uh, it never happened again after that. Uh, the first year, 1909, it was a road race. Uh, so they... 395.6 miles, they actually did a road race that was almost 400 miles long. Well, 17 laps, so they're, they repeated it. They repeated the same route over the road 17 times. But then in uh, 1910, they moved it to a speedway, to uh, Indianapolis Motor Speedway. And uh, it was so it was exactly 200 miles long at 80 laps. And then that was it. It never happened again. Uh, Bill Mead, here's, here we have Bill Mead mentioned. Bill Mead, time, the, time Chevrolet, a mile a minute, they say. So he was he was a judge or somebody who ran the stopwatch and uh, uh, and a Chevrolet uh, didn't quite hit a mile a minute apparently his winning speed was only forty nine point two eight seven miles per hour but uh, he did set uh, a record in another race not the Cobe Cup but in another race he did set a record of. Uh, almost 60 miles an hour and which back then was <laughs> quite something and then in 1910 the winning speed was 73 miles an hour that's quite a quite an improvement and uh, by now Mary Jane has become a race car fan she's in the stands and she she hollers out Chevrolet's won so uh, so the song must have been written after that 1909 Cobe Cup race, Cobe trof Trophy race. And uh, <laughs> I guess that's about all. I can't think of anything else. I kind of lost it in the last chorus, but... Uh, uh, in a lot of places it was hard to get the lyrics to match up with the notes uh, it was written kind of loosely so uh, I don't know if Smalley was writing this as a promotional thing for Buick or if he was just a race fan uh, I also read that he made a, sometimes made a living as a promoter so he may have been a race promoter also uh, he may have been doing this as part of a promotion for the races and uh, I didn't do it in E flat like it's written I did it in C uh, 
partly for my voice and partly because it's way easier to play. And uh, moderato in common time, I probably did it faster than they meant to, but it seemed it went on for five and a half minutes already, even at this tempo I was doing it. So I guess that's all I have to say about it. Thank you very much.